Well, good morning. He is risen. Amen. Thanks for being here at the second service today. Um, so excited that you're here. My name is Alex, and I'm one of the pastors here at Fellowship. And, and like, uh, I'll just add my welcome onto that of CJ's from a little bit earlier. If we haven't had the opportunity to meet, I would love to meet you. Um, in fact, I'll be right out in the lobby right after the service. So if we haven't met, just stop by and say hi and shake a hand and uh, tell me your name, and then just please don't expect me to remember it next Sunday. But give me a few weeks in a row, and, and I'll have it down, I promise. But I'm super excited uh, that you're here today. This is a great day for me personally, uh, on a personal note, uh, because my older brother Rob and his wife uh, Di, Diane, are here today, and uh, all the way from sunny Southern California, except they tell me it's raining today in sunny Southern California. And so I'm excited that uh, they're here because um, since we've entered our professional lives, we've never really had the opportunity to see what the other does professionally, even though we're both in our 50s. And so he's a basketball coach, and I've never watched him coach a basketball game. So I guess now I have to fly to California (laughs) and watch a basketball game. So uh, anyway, I'm excited that they're here today on this Easter Sunday and um, anyway, this will be a good day. And just a quick word uh, of welcome to any of our guests and visitors that we do have. I do hope that you'll take just a moment and stop by one of our guest tents, uh, stations, kiosks, whatever you want to call them, uh, that are on either side of the worship center. If you didn't stop by on your way in, please stop by on your way out. We just have a, a small gift that, that we want to give, with, give to you. Uh, and in some ways, it's pretty comparable to what the students are going to get uh, next Sunday, the college students are going to get. There's some good stuff in there. Uh, there's a full-size Snicker bar in there. And so if you get hungry, like right after the service, I hear it really satisfies. And so <laughs> you can pick up one of those bags and eat that uh, on the way home. But we just love to have the opportunity to connect with you and uh, send you a little bit more information about our church. So really glad you decided to join us on this Easter Sunday. As Christians, Easter Sunday is that day that we recognize and we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who after dying on the cross, rose from the dead, and typically, because it's Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday, that's exactly what I would talk about. That's what I would preach about this morning. Uh, But listen, there is no resurrection without death. There's no resurrection without death, and so this morning, that's what I want to Uh, talk about. So I I think it's fair to ask then when we consider this event of the resurrection and the cross is to ask the question, why? Like, why did Jesus die? And um, what did he die for? What does that mean? For whom uh, did he die? And so on this Easter Sunday, we're going to back up a few days in the timeline, a couple of days Uh, before the resurrection, we're going to focus on one of the very last phrases that Jesus said while he was on the earth. Actually, in the Greek, it's it's one word. It's the word tetelestai. Um, That's just a fun word to say, and I think we should say it together. And so, ready? One, two, three. Tetelestai. So, it's one word in the Greek, but that translates into the English as three words. The phrase, it is finished. I believe those three words, I believe whether it's one word to tell us I or three words in English, I think those are some of the most powerful and meaningful words that have ever been spoken in human history. I don't think this is preacher talk. Uh, I don't think this is hyperbole. I honestly believe that these are some of the most meaningful and impactful and powerful words that have ever been uttered. It is finished. These words were spoken by Jesus while he was hanging on the cross. And if you're familiar with the story um, or or of the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if you you read all of those uh, gospel accounts of uh, the cross, then you know that Jesus said different things to different people while he was hanging on the cross. In fact, if you were at our Good Friday service Friday night, that's exactly what we went through. We went through all last seven sayings of Jesus while he was on the cross. While Jesus was on the cross, there were a couple of other thieves that were there. There were a a couple of other people suffering the same fate of Jesus. We often forget about that part of the story. He wasn't alone. There were others that 
were there and being crucified as well. In fact, they're referred to as criminals, as thieves. And at some point, while Jesus is hanging on the cross, he strikes up a conversation with one of these other gentlemen, and he looks at him, and he says to this thief, he says, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, Jesus had some family that was there that was present. His mother, in fact, was there, and at one point while Jesus is hanging on the cross, he knows how this is going to end, and his mother's there. He looks at his mother, and he says, woman, behold your son. And then he turns to the beloved disciple John, one of his best friends, and he looks at him and he says, and behold thy mother. In other words, John, I'm leaving. You now need to take care of my mom for me. At some point, because this is an excruciating way to die, Jesus is hanging on the cross and naturally he gets thirsty. And so he turns to some Roman guards and he he just says, I thirst, I'm thirsty. And then, just in some of the most terrible words ever spoken, sorrowful words, he, I'm assuming, looks up at his Father in heaven and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But the one phrase that he spoke that would live on in perpetuity, that wasn't just for that moment in time, but I think is relevant for you and I today, is the phrase, to tell us, die, it is finished. In short, I believe Jesus spoke that word to you. I believe he spoke that word to me. And I believe that he wants to, us to wrestle with what it means. I believe he intends for us to know that he accomplished something on that cross 2,000 years ago on that very first Easter. And so this morning, I want to explore this phrase a little bit more. And I think another reasonable question for us to ask as we're getting started this morning is this. What is the it Like, what is it? If it was finished, then what is it that was finished? And so this morning, uh, I've compiled a a little list. I want to share with you four things. They're really four systems uh, that I believe that Jesus finished by his death on the cross. Now, you may have more, uh, but these are the four primary systems that, that when he was speaking and said, it is finished, I think these things matter to you and me. Uh, more than many others. And these are really four systems. Um, These are four things that keep us from living the lives that you and I were meant to live. And so I want to point them out to you because I believe when Jesus said it, it is finished, he was talking about bringing an end to these four systems. Here's the first one. Um, The first is the system of sin. Now, Um, I know that sounds like a really churchy word, but in the original context, that word literally just means missing the mark. Uh, I'm I'm pretty sure that had to do with archers who would draw back uh, their bow and arrow and fire off an arrow, and if you missed the target, whatever it was that you were aiming at, if you missed, well, then you missed the mark. In other words, you sinned. Here's what you were aiming for. You missed it. You're now guilty of sin. The first time we even read about this as a concept, not as bow and arrow, but a concept in the Bible, is in the book of Genesis. You might remember the story about Adam and Eve, our very first parents, how God had placed them in the Garden of Eden. He had put um, all of this incredible like landscape. I'm, it was, I'm, we, we, I, I wasn't there, by the way, but I'm going to assume for a second. Uh, I mean, I'm 55, just not quite that old. And uh, I'm going to assume for a second it was very lush. And we know from reading Genesis that God put all kinds of trees in the garden that had all kinds of fruits that were on it. And he said, hey, I've provided all of this stuff for you. You can eat from all of these trees. Um, Oh yeah, by the way, just not this one tree. There's this one tree called the knowledge of good and evil, and, and you're to not eat from that tree. And if you know the story, then you know that eventually Adam and Eve ignore Uh, God's command there, and they, in fact, do eat the fruit from that tree. Therefore, they sin. They miss the mark. That's when sin entered the world. Romans 5 says this, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, 
And so it's talking about Adam there, just because Adam and Eve mess everything up by eating this fruit, and death through sin, in this way, death spread to all people because all sin. So it might not be fair, but in essence, what Paul's saying here is that you and I were born into a world where the system of sin already existed. Not only that, but Paul's saying in this verse that everything in this world is moving toward, it is on a trajectory line. If you follow it out to completion, things are headed toward death. That is unless something gets in its way. The system of sin, I think, is the reason uh, during this time of year when you go out to your vehicle, it's got this little layer of yellow dust on the top of it, this pollen that makes us all sneeze, right? That's why we have allergies. Um, it, I don't know if that has anything to do with stint, sin or not. I'm just, that's, I'm going to blame it on sin. Uh, it's terrible. But it is why we have things like other chronic illnesses. It's why we have cancer. In this world, it's why people suffer from heart attacks. It's why there's ALS. It's why there's diabetes. Sin is also the reason that we experience famine and flood and other disasters and tornadoes. It's why there's divorce. It's why there's jealousy. That's why you and I do things that we don't want to do. It's why we tell little white lies. It's why we keep secrets from one another. It's why we get angry. I mean, the list just kind of goes on and on and on. All of these things are on the earth because of the system of sin, and they're all headed toward death, ultimate death. But it's not the only system at play. The second system I want to bring to your attention is the system of shame. The system of shame. Um, if sin is the mistakes that we make, then, then shame's a little bit trickier. Shame is that thing that we carry around with us all the time. It's that little voice that tells us that we are the mistake. Shame has plagued us, again, since Adam and Eve bit into the fruit in the Garden of Eden, and suddenly... Um, if you know the story again, they bite into that fruit, and as a result, they realize that they are exposed. We've got some little ears in the room, so I'm trying to clean it up as much as I can, but they realize they don't have any clothes on, and so what do they do? They make clothes so they can hide themselves from one another. They duck down behind a bush so that they can hide from God. Their first instinct now is to hide from each other and to hide from God. And, and, and it's because they sin, they now stand vulnerable before God in a whole new way. Now they are weak, damaged, sinful people who live in a dangerous world. You and I, we live in that same dangerous world. And because of that, we have that same instinct to want to hide ourselves from one another and to hide ourselves from God and try to cover up our mistakes. Do we not? Again, shame is not the mistakes that we make. Shame's thinking and believing that we're the mistake that will never measure up, that will never fit in. Right? Shame is what is holding some of your marriages back, your other relationships, your relationships with your friends. Shame is sometimes what's holding your parenting back. People walk around with a cloud of shame because based on, especially in this day and age with social media, we peek in on the lives of others, and, and so we look at their lives, and we see, and we watch, and, and we observe, and here's what we do. We believe that we don't measure up, and it causes us to feel shame. We feel like we've missed the mark, and so shame is the system that's running in the background of your life and mine, and we need to deal with it. The third thing, the third system is the system of self. Um, I don't know if you know this, but there is literally something called the world population clock. Has anybody ever heard of that? Yeah, you can Google it. Go search it. It's online. You can just Google world population clock. There's a couple of different clocks, and what it is, it's, a, it's really a tally that, that's running in live time, adding and subtracting numbers from it. Uh, taking into account all the population of 
uh, everybody on planet Earth, and it's accounting for uh, births and deaths. So it like goes backwards and goes forwards and goes backwards, and it's just changing rapidly every second. And depending on which clock that you uh, look at, as of this morning, there's at least over 8 billion people. One clock had just under 8.1 billion people. Another had a little over 8.1 billion people on it on planet Earth. I don't know how they can know that, but I believe it. It's on the internet. <laughs> so do you, you know what one thing all 8.1 billion people have in common on planet Earth? Is we think life revolves around us. <laughs> The system's working in your life right now to make your money revolve around you, to make your time revolve around you, to make your weekends, to make your hobbies, to make your vacation. Everything revolve around you, to make your job, to make your school, to have your spouse, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your spouse, everyone revolve around you. Do you know what one of the worst things in the world that you can do is? Have people revolve around you. The system of self causes us to put up what I like to call a projected perfection persona. That's just fun to say, isn't it? Projected perfection persona. Here's what it really means. It means we just put up a false front, right? This is the thing that, that we put up that tells the world uh, that we have it all together. My wife, Wendy, and I, uh, we've been married 33 years as of this August, um, in 33 years, you know what? We've never had an argument. <laughs> we always get along. We always call each other sweetie and schnookums and everything's peachy. We really don't. We don't use those terms. But you get the picture. Everything's great, right? Why? Because we've got it all together. My kids are a little bit older now. They're 30 and uh, 27 but when they were little and I was a pastor and on staff at a church, on a Sunday morning like this, especially Easter, my kids, they would wake up at the crack of dawn, uh, wake uh, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. Dad, he is risen. He is risen indeed. And then they would fix themselves breakfast, get themselves dressed, <laughs> be ready to go on time when Daddy needed to leave. We just sang praise and worship songs all the way to church. It was a glorious time. You know why? Because we have it all together. This morning, man, I'm wearing not jeans. I'm wearing slacks, pants. I'm wearing a blazer. I got my hair cut last week. I even have my Easter egg socks on. You know why? Because I have it all together. Right? That's what a projected perfection persona does. We put that up in front of the world. But you, you and I both know what the reality is, right? That, that's not real. That's not really uh, the, the, that doesn't really describe my relationship with my wife or my family. I don't have it all together all the time. That system of self is there. And it's running in the background in it, and it wants me to orient everything that's going on around me, about me. That, that system of self running in the background of your life. And then the last system I want to address this morning is one that a lot of people don't even believe uh, is real. And, um, and it's really a person. It's the system of Satan or the devil. Um, he was an angel who decided that he wasn't going to worship God. In fact, he was kind of stuck in that system of self. Uh, he wanted everybody to worship him, and as a result... God cast him uh, out of heaven, sent him to this world, and Satan became the God, lowercase g, of this world, and he is active today. Uh, if you were to do one of those man-on-the-street interviews or polls or whatever, if you were to just walk around downtown or whatever in, in Longview or most of the little towns around here, we kind of live a little bit in the, in the Bible Belt, kind of down here in the south in Texas, and so we love us some church, and churches are packed on this Easter Sunday, and so if you were to stop people on the street, the overwhelming majority, perhaps 75 to 80 percent of people, if you ask them the question, hey, do you believe in God? 
They would probably say yes. If you said, do you believe in Jesus? Was Jesus real? They would probably say yes. And then that same majority of people, if you say, well, how about Satan? An overwhelming majority don't even believe that he's real. And so I just want to make a statement. It might be an unpopular statement, but I don't care about being popular. I care more about being biblical, and that's this. He is real. He does exist. He is not your friend. He is your enemy. He is trying with all of his might to stay in the shadows of your life. If you are expecting him, how many of you are familiar with Torchy's Tacos? Greatest tacos on the planet, greatest queso on the planet, by the way. I think we have one in Tyler. And I will, I was going to say I'll fight you, but I'm really, I'm not that mad about it. I just, I would argue with you that it is the greatest queso on the planet. So if you ever get the chance, go to Torchy's. I digress. It's Easter Sunday. I've already preached once. Now I'm off topic. Here's the deal. Here's why I brought that up. Torchies has a mascot. Do you know what it is? It's the devil. And if you're expecting the devil, if you're expecting Satan to walk out uh, dressed all in red with a pitchfork and horns on his head and a pointy little tail, it's not how it works. He's trying to stay in the background and in the shadows of your life. He's That little voice that's whispering in your ear that's just saying something like, hey, the grass is greener on the other side. Things are better for you over here. He's that little voice whispering in your ear trying to convince you that there's someone else better for you than your spouse. He's trying to tempt you. And he's trying to distract you. He is real. He's not your friend. He's your enemy. He is alive, and he does have real authority on this earth. So we have to recognize these systems are at work in the world. The system of sin, where we miss the mark. We do those things that we don't want to do, and we do those things that, man, we we know better than that. Shame, thinking that we are actually the mistake. Self, trying to orient uh, the world and everything and all people and all things around us. And then last but not least, I think the one behind it all, pulling all the strings, Satan. These systems that are at work in the world are why it's so important that you and I reconcile the reality of what Jesus spoke on the cross 2,000 years ago when he said, to tell us thy, it is finished. And so I want to show you in Scripture just briefly where you can find that Jesus brings an end to all four of these systems. Romans 6.23 says this, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? Right? So listen, eternal life is not something that you deserve, it's not something that you earn, and it's not something that you work for. All you have to do is receive and believe that when Jesus said, it is finished, he was saying that to you and to me. When he said, to tell us die, sin was finished. But it gets better. He didn't just finish sin on the cross, he finished shame as well. Romans 8, verse 1 says this, there is therefore now no shame, no condemnation, For those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. And so what was true for the Apostle Paul who wrote those words is also true for you and me because the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ has the power to save all 8.1 billion people, every single person on planet earth. And when he died on the cross, he took our sin, he took our shame, and in exchange, he gave us, Scripture says, his righteousness. And Paul says, set us free from shame. And so when he said, to tell us die, shame was finished. But I'm also glad self met its match on the cross. I'm so glad uh, that it's not left up to me. I'm so glad that it's not left up to you. I'm so relieved to understand that me trying to control everything is a myth. That me trying to project 
an image of perfection that I have it all together, <clears throat> that it's a myth, that I don't have to carry the weight of the world, that I don't have to carry the weight of anxiety and project this image like everything is perfect. Second Corinthians 5 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and see the new has come. Friends, can I just tell you something real quick? Following Jesus is not about trying harder. It's about surrendering more. In other words, I think Paul's saying because of Jesus, the person that you were and I once was is gone. That person is dead. And the new man or the new woman has come. He looked at self and said, Self, you don't have to do it. When he said to tell us die, he, he said, I'll carry it for you. It is finished. I'll do it. But it just keeps getting better because I believe that 2,000 years ago when Jesus died on the cross, that Satan really thought that he had accomplished something. Because I believe that he's real. I believe that he was there when the angry mob began to turn against Jesus. And the crowd began to shoot, shout, crucify him. I, I believe that Satan was there when the disciples, seeing kind of the writing on the wall, what's happening with Jesus, knowing that they may suffer the same fate, began to disperse and leave him one by one. I think Jesus was there just grinning ear to ear. I think he was there when they drove the nails through his hands and they thrust a spear into his side. I believe he was there when Jesus took his last breath. And I think in that moment, Satan thought, yes, the Son of God, I did it. I won. But Colossians 2 says this, in this way, meaning by dying on a cross, in this way, by dying on a cross, he, Jesus, disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities, in other words, Satan. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. See, Jesus died a death that we deserved, and Satan thought in that moment that he was winning. But when Jesus said, it is finished, he said, Satan you know what? You may still have some power and authority on this earth, but you no longer have power and authority over those I claim as my own. Also, here's one final thing that you should know about this word, to telestai, or, or this phrase, it is finished. Depending on what context it was used, it took on a different meaning. And so it was one word that was used in a few different contexts. Um, it was a military term. So you could use it in a military sense because if you use it in a military sense, it meant victory. So imagine for a minute you are the commander of the army, you're the general, and the king sends your troop uh, out to battle. And so you guys go out, you face the enemy, you win the battle, you would come back and you would tell the king to tell us die. It's finished. We won. It was also a legal term, or kind of like a, a judicial term. It was used in the context of when um, somebody was uh, served a, a sentence, and then they would complete that sentence fully, right? And so let's just assume, I'm going to pick on somebody for just a minute, Dirk. I picked on somebody, Chuck was sitting on the front row. He was easy pickings in the first service. Well, let's say Dirk committed a crime, right? You, you, you know, you commit the crime, you do the time here in America. That's how it works. And, and so let's just say he was sentenced to 10 years in prison. He's not. He's a great guy. That'll never happen. I even feel bad for using this illustration. He's sentenced to 10 years. He completely serves that sentence when he gets out to tell us that it is finished. This would have been a better one to use for you, Dirk, because it was also an accounting term. 
<laughs> Dirk's an accountant by trade. I should have saved that one for you. It's an accounting term that meant your debt was paid in full. So, so just imagine, I mean, we've all had loans at some point. I look around the room and see college students. We got college loans. Most of us, you know, the government owns our home. We would pay it off forever. Uh, as you pay off your mortgage, uh, you pay off your car. But, but, but if you're ever able to pay off a loan, and I've done that before with, with cars, um, it, it's incredible. Isn't it really awesome? You go check the mailbox and you get that envelope and you open it up and it's like you owe zero they should just stamp to tell us thy, because that's what it means. It is finished. Your debt is paid in full. Here's the bottom line. When you and I use that word, it is finished, it means done, through, and complete. But when Jesus said it is finished, he meant it was time for your life and mine to begin. So friends, this morning, let me ask you a question. Are you living in the finished work of Jesus on the cross? Have you let sin and shame and self and Satan be done in your life? That's the heart of Christ for you this Easter that you would say, I want to live in the finished work of Jesus for the rest of my life. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment? The worship team's going to come back up. We're going to conclude our service in just a moment <clears throat> with one final worship song. But in the next minute or two, I just want to talk to a couple of different groups of people. If you're here this morning and you are already a Christian, the question for you on this Easter becomes, are you living under the influence of Jesus? Like, is the Lord directing your steps? Is Jesus directing how you spend your time and your money and your resources, what your career is, what your college major is, who your boyfriend is, girlfriend, who your spouse is? See, I believe men and women who live under the influence of Jesus <clears throat> is how communities will change. It's how your neighborhood, your street will change. It's how your workplace will change. It's how our schools will change. It's how our neighborhoods will Will change. It's how the state of Texas will change. So I just believe the world becomes a, a better place when people take the finished work of Jesus on the cross and they say, you know what? I believe that and I want to make it mine. And so if that's you and you're here today, maybe you're thinking, you know what? I, I have already professed belief in Jesus, but maybe I'd like to recommit myself to being done with sin and shame and self. And, and then there's probably another group of people in the room, perhaps you're here today and you've yet to believe and profess Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And so I don't think I'd be doing my job as a pastor if I didn't give you that opportunity. And so to you, I'd like to say now is, is that moment where you get to decide if you want to make this personal. Does Tetelestai just get to live in the past or does it get to live in the present in your life? If you want to make this personal today, I want to invite you um, to just say this little prayer. Uh, I'm just going to lead us in a little prayer and there's nothing magical about these words, but wherever you're seated in the worship center, you could just repeat them to yourself after me as a prayer to God. You can pray your own words if you want, but if you want a little help, just pray this to yourself. Say something like, Dear Jesus, thank you for your finished work on the cross. I believe 
that you died for my sin. And starting today, I want to live under your influence. I pledge allegiance to a new king. I want to live under your influence. Thank you for paying my debt in full. In Jesus' name, amen. As we bring the service to a close, would you all just stand with me for just a moment? The band's going to begin to lead us, and here's what I want to say. If you just prayed that prayer, if that was the first time that that you prayed that prayer, uh, first, I just want to say congratulations. You've done the most amazing thing that you could ever do. But if you did just pray that prayer, I'm going to invite you to do something that's going to take a little bit of courage. See, right at the end of the service, I'm going to be down here. A couple of other staff members, a few of our elders will be here. And we'd love for you to just step out from wherever you're seated, walk down front here. Nobody's going to think anything about it. They're all going to be singing. But I want to encourage you to take that step. Come down here, meet with one of us. We just want to pray for you. We want to help you take your next step. And if you're here this morning, maybe you would already say, well, I profess Jesus as Lord and Savior, but I would like to recommit myself. I'd like to make this Easter, March 31st, 2024, just draw a line in the sand and say, you know what? I am going to live under the influence of Jesus. And so I just... I want to pray with somebody. We want to help you too. It's why we exist as a church. And so as we began to sing, just two things should be happening. People coming forward and praying or you singing. And so as the band leads us, we'll continue our worship.